begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Oh God, our God, as we address the theme under the uh, teaching of uh, Charles Hodge and the tradition of the church vis-a-vis -vis thy holy word concerning this all-comprehending plan of thine, what led thee to create in the first place, to make creatures and to ordain a fall and a way of redemption and all these awesome wonders of this world of ours and the invisible world, the world yet to be. Help us, we pray thee, as we ponder these verities in the light of what thou thyself, who alone doth know what thy purpose is and ever shall be, doth reveal it to us. Help us, we pray thee, through the sharpening of these historic controversies, seeing it one way and another way, even while earnestly endeavoring to understand what thou thyself hast spoken by thy word. Help us to realize that these giants of the past can err, we certainly can err, and that it doesn't excuse us because of that possibility, but rather alerts us to that danger that we may be all the more resolved to apply ourselves earnestly and to let thy word have free course in us. We pray that thou wilt enlighten us concerning these matters of infra and supralapsarianism and the various plans of salvation that the infralapsarian church of the ages has seen. Guide us in our deliberations and conversations with one another as we endeavor to penetrate the better by the help and the provocation of one another as differing ideas or aspects of truth are brought to our attention and to our focus. Help us above all, we pray thee, to welcome truth because we love him who is the way, the truth, and the life, and to abhor evil because we know it's contrary to his will and that we can learn truth from enemies of the faith and we can learn error from friends of the faith so as to be always on our guard that we may have an eye single to thy glory and to seek nothing but thy truth. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. Now, as you know, we're starting the uh, third part of Hodge's uh, theology here, and we're giving three afternoons to it. Skipping next uh, Easter weekend, we resume with our studies uh, the following uh, Sabbath with the next chapter to follow this one, the very important uh, chapter on the covenant, which is certainly a great distinctive of Reformed theology. It always has been, and it's all the more so since the advent of uh, dispensationalism, which came at about the same time as the writing of this book. But Hodge, uh, Hodge never seems to have felt the impact of it adequately and never refers to it um, uh, by name or very explicitly. But nevertheless, he's dealing with principles that concern it. And you and I, living in the 20th century and being more aware of it, by far than he was, should be all the more sensitive. But it certainly reaches its major focus in that chapter on the covenant. And we usually refer uh, co uh, Reformed theologians vis-a-vis -vis dispensationalists as covenant theologians, as over against dispensational theologians, because the dispensational theologians, as you know, claim to be Calvinist also, limited Calvinist. But nevertheless, they claim to be Calvinist. Yes, please. Yes, um, what was the difference between Yeah. 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 Bullinger, of course, is what we call extreme uh, dispensationalism. See, uh, the whole thing started on the American scene with this uh, rightly dividing the word of truth by C. I. Schofield, and rightly dividing meant finding the proper partitions of the Bible, and he found a, a new partition in the uh, in the uh, covenant of, in the doctrine of grace in the church in this particular era interrupting the Old Testament law period that would be resumed at the kingdom when Christ uh, returns. Well, Bullinger, working within that framework as a dispensationalist, nevertheless felt that that was entirely too broad and imprecise a classification of the doctrine of the church and grace and so on. And he find, found refinements in that. And ultimately, only the prison epistles belong to this dispensation you know, and all cer certain Pauline teaching in the uh, uh, prison epistles. The, the uh, standard dispensationalist, the more or less traditional one, Dallas is the greatest uh, 
institutional defender of uh, traditional uh, uh, dispensationalism. They, they try to hold just to this division of, uh, of law and grace and kingdom and tend to uh, pretend rather, instead of sharpening and subdividing them as, as the uh, so-called ultra-dispensationalists, the Bullingerites they're sometimes called, O'Hareites because John O'Hare in Chicago, Illinois, held that type of doctrine very influentially and the STAM carries it on today and all these other consider them extreme whereas these uh, so-called extremists insist that these people are just halting uh, make a complete break follow your principle and I'm, I'm with the extreme dispensationalists I think they're quite right the principles on which dispensationalism is operating have to go the way of Bob Thiem and the way of, uh, of um, Bullinger and John O'Hare and Stam and people like that, but they don't see it that way and they resist it, but they're embarrassed by it too. They don't quite know how to handle it. Bob Thiem, for example, is a graduate of Dallas Seminary and he'll sometimes refer to it and that makes uh, the Dallas people rather embarrassed because he's, uh, he's an extremist in their opinion. They're, they're uh, timid, uh, uh, you know, halting followers in his uh, opinion. And my sympathies and that pattern of thought is with uh, with these uh, people who are considered ultra dispensationalists, I would consider them more consistent uh, dispensationalists than the standard. Ryrie is the best known of the standard uh, uh, dispensationalists. Saying well, somebody was talking about this morning these gradations here and so on. You have a man like uh, Ryrie, who's uh, had a very fine mind and very sophisticated person and multi-millionaire. And if you were married to a millionaire and so on, and uh, wears penny suits all the time, just the same. He's an interesting sort of a person, but he's got a, got a good mind. And I think he senses much of the criticism that comes and shades. He always leans more and more in our direction. This Zane Hodges is a colleague of his. He's, a, he's quite at home in New Testament uh, Greek and so on, but he's not a theological thinker, and it's more black and white with him, and he get more militant about it, but much less uh, sophisticated. Now, on the other hand, it's Bob Thiem, who's a retired military figure, naval figure, and so on, as a pretty much of a cut and dried figure, has all the answers very precisely spelled out and very efficiently communicated, and he's very, very sure of himself, but he's very rabid, and in my opinion, you see, but rabidly consistent with this pattern of thought. A person like Ryrie is a little uncomfortable with him, but he can't dare disown him, you see, because he sees too much of that principle, and a person like Gerson said, go ahead, Ryrie, this is where you're going to have to follow. You don't want to go there, but you're either going to have to come over where you're leaning, but you're not coming, and so on, or else uh, the pressure is in that direction. That's my opinion, you see. And uh, I think uh, I think uh, Zane Hodges would say Gerstner's right there. You go, come on, Briary. And so Zane Hodges looks like an odd man out at Dallas. See, Dallas is a great institutional defender of dispensationalism, but it's slipping a little bit in our direction, slipping in the right way, in our opinion, slipping in the wrong way. And Zane Hodges and, and Bob Thiem's opinion, and uh, so on. And I keep saying, keep on coming there. These people. Uh, like Hodges, getting to be more and more of a minority report within dispensation. I feel a kind of sympathy for him. He's an authentic, kosher dispensationalist, which is wrong, but he's consistent with it. These people are moving in the right direction, but they're moving away from their own avowed orthodoxy, if you follow me and all that type of thing. But that'll come out a little bit in the discussion. But just the interesting thing is that this whole movement began roughly around 1830 with this John Nelson Darby, who's by far the ablest theologian the dispensational school of thought has ever had. And the, um, his, uh, he's like Russell to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Very few people know about him today, but the Jehovah's Witnesses are still propagating Russellite doctrine, and the dispensationalists are still propagating Darbyite doctrine, even though they've not heard of John Nelson Darby in many, in many cases. But he's the great towering uh, theologian, but the man who made it popular in this country is C.I. Schofield, and then the great institutional defender is the Dallas as a dispensational seminary. All the Bible schools are, are committed uh, uh, to it, but uh, a real struggle, uh, a real struggle is on. But here's Hodge right in the middle of it. The Southern theologian, whom we're not studying now, da Dabney, fully aware of dispensationalism, and writes very acute attacks on dispensationalism. A contemporary of Hodge, uh, well, he lived a couple decades longer and so on, but he was major, ma active mainly in the second half of last century and very much uh, aware of it, and writes very astute uh, uh, reform critiques of, uh, of dispensationalism. Well, Hodge, it's almost passing unnoticed. I can't quite understand it myself. A, a, war, a Warfield, a Hodge's successor, is fully aware of it and uh, writes a, a very definitive critique of Barry Chaffer's He That's Spiritual to show that uh, the fallacious doctrine which uh, 
on the right. But anyway, I mustn't ramble on on this because uh, it, but it, it's relevant, especially to our chapter on the covenant, which we take up two weeks uh, uh, from now. And you may notice where there's some implications of Hodge vis-a-vis -vis this. But what I'm saying generally is we are covenant theologians. A covenant is a very central concept in the Reformed uh, orthodoxy and developed very strongly in the Westminster Confession of uh, Faith. Many of our churches are called covenant church, covenant this, covenant and so on, covenant seminary and uh, all that. And the, the dispensational type of thought was in opposition to that unified covenant over against divided and differing kinds of, uh, of dispensation. So though it's not sharply delineated by Hodge, nevertheless, it, I'm alerting you to the fact that you read this next chapter for two weeks from now, you be sensitive to that because it's on the scene in Hodge's day. It's been powerfully felt in this country in the Presbyterian Church in 1870 through uh, a friend out there in St. Louis uh, in particular. Brooks, but um, for some reason or other, Hodge is not so uh, sensitive to it. But now we're on part three, soteriology, the doctrine of, uh, of salvation. And we take this first chapter in the plan of salvation, next week the covenant, and then the final uh, uh, third uh, session on this on the vocation uh, aspect. But God has a plan, such a plan. I was kidding this morning about Bill Bright and Campus Crusades, famous for that. God has a plan for you, and uh, that plan is... Uh, is um, a different kind of a plan. What Hodge is talking about here is a plan which God has designed and which he's going to carry out in meticulous detail. No loose edges at all. The kind of plan that uh, Bill Bright has for Campus Crusade is, is not a plan. It's a, an invitation and an ideal he's talking about. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. Yield to the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit and your life will be lived to the full. That's not a plan in the sense of this is something God is going to carry out and everybody, which is what we're talking about here, that's just a command or an ideal that everybody ought to strive for and possess and is commanded to do and so on. But Bill Bright is primarily a promoter and a very efficient promoter at that and, and not, a, uh, not a theologian who's hardly sensitive to the difference, but it is a serious difference. And because uh, Bright and the Campus Crusade doesn't make this distinction, I think they do a great disservice to the church. But God has such a plan, says... Uh, Hodge, and he points out the word um, is uh, oikonomia, that we translate it economy, but it means administration or plan, but the whole thing is it's not the kind of plan we make, which we may or may not be able to carry out. It's a plan, uh, it's a plan which, since God makes it instead of ourselves, there's no possibility of it not being carried out. It's going to be carried out, and he, the thing is, he's not hit or miss about it. He knows precisely from all eternity exactly what he's going to do. He has the plan. You and I have our plans for vocation, marriage, locations, and all that type of thing. They may or may not be carried out. We're very, very few. Man proposes, God disposes. But when God proposes, he also disposes. And the question now is what kind of a plan he has. But is there any question about these first pages about the fact that God does indeed have a plan? The importance uh, is the next subject, then, if there's no question on that. The importance of the knowledge of this plan and 314, and down about 10 sentences uh, is a sentence that I'd like to comment on. In the, if the end or purpose of redemption, that's a word uh, that's interesting. See, even in 1870, they were still using that word end in the sense of purpose. Man's chief end is man's chief purpose and so on. And end is commonly used that way. That's where the, uh, that's where the Oxford Dictionary, the Historical Dictionary is interesting. They'll trace that, when that word came into use and that sense of design and how it was used by Samuel Johnson and how it was used by this writer and that writer and the other writer. And uh, uh, here, here in 1870, we find Charles Hodge using it in that sense of purpose when he's not quoting. We very seldom use it that way at the, uh, at the present time. But if the end or purpose of redemption as well as of creation and of providence is the production of the greatest amount of happiness then Christianity is one thing. If the end or purpose be the glory of God, then Christianity is another thing. What is the end of God? Is it the happiness of the creature in the creation and redemption, happiness, or is it glory of God? Creature, because that would apply to angels as well as men, and not just men, and inanimate creatures too. Jonathan Edwards, Jr. insists that one of the contributions of his father was to, in his nature of true virtue, was to prove that these are one and the same thing. Now you can see that that never even crossed Charles Hodge's mind. I'm giving this uh, lecture at uh, Covenant Seminary on Edwards's uh, 
uh, theory of virtue and his, ref and his Calvinistic critics. Now, Hodge is one of his critics, and I'll mention this as one of the, uh, one of the points here. He obviously thinks that Edwards has erred in this regard in making the happiness of the creature uh, uh, God's end, though it's perfectly clear that he also says the glory of God. And there are people who interpret Edwards as really thinking of uh, B and not A. Hodge is more thinking of A rather than B. And his predecessor, uh, um, Archibald Alexander, very definitely pinned this on, uh, on Edwards. They all admire Edwards, but they think that Edwards slipped at this point. This is one of the places where they think the great Edwards uh, slipped out of the reformed orbit. And uh, it's interesting that they think in that direction. And yet it's so obvious, he's constantly talking about the glory of God, that for anybody to say that the chief purpose of God in the creation of the world, according to Jonathan Edwards, was the happiness of the creature. <laughs> I mean, even the secular writers would turn cold on a thing like that. Haratunian, for example, uh, feels that that's very definitely the goal of Jonathan. And that later, people slipped into this type of thing and fell into utilitarianism, but that was because they were departing from Edwards. He says, he said that the end of New England theology, say roughly 1750, man's chief end was to glorify God. By the, by the middle of our century, God's chief end is to glorify man. There's been a total reversal. In the early days, especially in its climax in Jonathan Edwards, the glory of God was raised to supreme glory as, as the purpose of God and so on. And this is very definitely secondary. Now, as I say, these, some of these reformed critics, I can't go into all the details of this, see it the other way around. But the thing I'm mentioning right now is the opinion of his son, Jonathan Edwards, Jr., that one of his father's contributions to reformed theology was to show that these were one and the same thing. If I read that sentence again in the line, and I think he's right, I think John, Jr. is right on that. If the end or purpose of redemption as well as of creation and of providence is the production of the greatest amount of happiness, then Christianity is one thing. If the end be the glory of God, then Christianity is another thing. See, these are two different things, mutually exclusive, in the mind, apparently, of Charles Hyde. According to Jonathan Edwards, according to his son's interpretation, and I agree with his son on that point, not everybody would, and so on, these are one and the same thing. The promotion of the glory of God and the greatest happiness of the creature are one and the same thing. This is the way God promotes his glory, by the happiness of the creature. But Immediately a person says, but Edwards is no universalist. Those are some people who feel driven in that direction uh, there, but it, it's absolutely impossible to interpret Edwards that way. They know that, that uh, the happiness of the creature does not mean the happiness of the total creation. So uh, how could Junior or anybody else square it? How does Edwards himself square it and so on? Well, what he is maintaining is that the happiness of any creature is in the glorification of God. These are not separable concepts. You cannot have the glorification of God without happiness, nor can you have happiness, true happiness, without the glorification of God. And the way by which the greatest glorification of God and the greatest glorification of creatures comes about is in this Augustinian pattern that uh, Hodge talks about in the, in the sense that God allows some to perish as well as chooses some to eternal salvation. That's actually the way the greatest happiness of the total creation does actually occur. And you draw from that the conclusion that uh, if God saved everybody, actually as much happiness would not be produced as his saving some persons and not all. And the reason for that is when you find people uh, working into it, and the Hodge would be in the same territory, the happiness of the saints in heaven is actually promoted by the misery of the damned in hell. Why? Because uh, those in heaven or on earth contemplating the situation and so on contemplate the damnation of the wicked. They recognize the justice of it, the righteousness of it, the purpose of it, the wisdom of it, and they sing their hallelujahs to God. And the end result is more real happiness to the creature with the insistence on the glory of God and the inseparability of the two. But as far as Charles Hodge is concerned, these uh, are just two different, fundamentally two different conceptions of uh, of Christianity. And I think most people think of Hodge, but I do think of Hodge as being superficial when he says that. Any question or comment uh, on that point? Page 315, how the plan of God can be known. And of course, that's by Scripture only, and comparing Scripture with Scripture and everything. And now he takes the, uh, a look uh, at supralapsarianism, and then later on at uh, infralapsarianism. 
and um, I, uh, you all have a basic uh, concept of it. Supra means above or before the fall. Uh, supra lapsarianism, be above the fall. Uh, lapsus is just a Latin term for fall. Lapsarianism, I won't uh, fill that out. And infra, or sub as it's called, is uh, below or after or under uh, contemplating the fall. This is an eternal decree. God understands all things from eternity, but according to this view, he's contemplating man as man, man as creatable, homo uh, creabilis, and over here he's contemplating man as fallen, homo lapsus. And uh, you've heard me give this diagram about Augustine, who's the most famous of all of the infralapsarians. Man is a mass of fallen people in Adam. And God is contemplating man as, after the fall, infralapsus, lapsum, in the uh, fallen condition. And he could let them all perish. He could, if he in mercy chose to do so, save everyone. As a matter of fact, he chose to save some ex massa perdidionis out of a mass of perishing people. He chose some, and he chose not to save others. Now, in the other view, God is, uh, this is God eternal. We don't get any temporality in this. Uh, God is simply contemplating man as man and uh, not thinking of him as, uh, uh, as uh, fallen at all. And he chooses, even then, as he contemplates the men who are to be, that's one of the criticisms you'll find Hodge giving later on, that this is a uh, criticism of a non-existing situation. It's a criticism of man as he never did exist, as uh, a whole host of uh, creatures, sinless, like uh, Father Adam and Eve and so on. But nevertheless, God is somehow or other, according to the supra, above or before the fall view, contemplating man as such. And he chooses that man as such, not as man the sinner, remember, but man as man. He chooses to save some and uh, damn others. That's the basis of the choice, and that leads to his decree of creation and fall, and ultimately they get down to this uh, uh, lapsed condition, and uh, at that particular point, the two Calvinistic lines run together on the same track. Here they're on separate tracks, but when it comes right down to God's choosing among those, the choice had made be been made before, but nevertheless, since God having chosen to uh, bring about uh, salvation and damnation, this is the way he does it, and now when all men in Adam fall and sin, he chooses, as he had eternally determined to choose man, uh, man as man, and so on, to save some and, and lose uh, and uh, not save uh, others. But the basic idea of uh, supra and infralapsarianism, the, uh, Rich, go ahead, please. Uh, when he was discussing this, he said that it's obvious that, that Calvin was not supralapsarian, and he gives a paragraph of Latin. What did Calvin say? <laughs> well, uh, where is that now? Right there. The bottom of what page? Uh, 316. Oh, in the consensus of Geneva. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, well, see this first part of it. The, this is one of the cases where he gives the Latin and doesn't, uh, use, it doesn't even tell. You can tell from the context that it's uh, Latin. But what he's saying here is, and the thing that proves it to um, uh, Hodge, is that, uh, that this choice, see, Sobolev's grown-up choice that God uh, chooses uh, them uh, who are seen as such. Ex damnata adami, that is. See, out of the damned of Adam. See, that's the point that proves the infralapsarianism in, in the Genevan catechism or consensus that Calvin authored. And so on. That's the key thing. It's ex damnata adai, as he writes here, but it means it's an abbreviation for adamni. Out of the damned of Adam. Those who've fallen in Adam. See, that means that God is choosing them as fallen. That's the point of the passage there. Get it? What are you going to say, Bob? Well, I was going to say that when you look at this from the standpoint of, of the eternity of God, and he's doing this from eternity with no time. He's choosing to there, do it. There is him. no before, no after. Uh, for him. That, for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have difficulty seeing the significance of this. Then. There is for you and me, you know. Well, yes. Yeah, well, what you're saying. And we're on. Yeah, uh, translating it in finite and temporal yeah. beings. Yeah, but I mean, uh, translating your remarks, it means that I can't see the significance of God. I'm not being a divine being, and so on. I'm, 
I'm a before and after type of person. All my thinking has to be before and after. That's perfectly true. You can't project yourself into God, and neither can any of us. But the point is you can conceive of a being who's different from you, for whom there is no before and after, who knows the after as well as he knows the before, and so on. You just say, I can't think that way. We can't think that way. But we can think of a being who thinks that way. And we know he has to be that way, because if it wasn't so, he'd be like you and me. He knows more now than he knew five minutes ago. I know more now than God, because you know God doesn't know anything more now than he knew five minutes ago that he'd known for all eternity. And he won't know anything at the end of eternity he doesn't know now. If he did, he'd be like you and me, only just a little brighter, that's all. A great deal brighter, but still a difference of degree. He would still be learning things. But step two of that has to be, that being the case, aren't we attributing to him this temporal limitation of our own in saying he makes a choice before or after? No, well, uh, if we're careless in our phrasing, we would be, if we're careful, and I may have been careless uh, in that, or Hodge may have been careless, but if we're careful, we're, uh, we'll say no, that, uh, that God, uh, see, I say a moment, he contemplates all this from eternity. He contemplates man as uh, fallen. He, he, he does that timelessly, you see. You and I, it takes us a moment even to say it. Now, it doesn't take him a moment to say it, to conceive it, to uh, execute it all. It may well be that our limitations of language are such that we can't help stumbling when we talk. This knowledge is too wonderful for us. You know, we can't project ourselves there. But we can, however, if we're careful, though it takes a great deal of care, uh, remember, remind ourselves all the time. He is not a creature. He knows these things uh, in a, a timeless moment. Uh, and if he didn't, he would be like us, which he is not, and we would be falling into the worship of the creature rather than the Creator. We have to remind ourselves, but can I, not, can I not accurately say God contemplating from all eternity, see, not learning anything, deliberating, you and I contemplating anything for a moment, it takes us a while to weigh it, get our spreadsheets out and all that type of stuff that the computers are supposed to do for us and, uh, and so on. <laughs> and uh, it, it takes a time even to think about the spreadsheet, you know, and all that type of thing. But that, that's, there's an eternal spreadsheet before God. See, there's no time, whatever. And they think, now in microseconds and so on, it's absolutely uh, uh, that way. And that uh, we just simply say, uh, God is contemplating it that way. We just have to remember what Bob Bell is saying. He's not taking any time to it. No, 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 no. It seemed to be the perfect uh, moment. But uh, <laughs> I can't help you. I'm a fellow human being, too. If you can't live without it, but, but uh, you know, better try, because that's the kind of creature he is, and we're the kind of creatures we are. He's the kind of being he is. Yes, this, this may be redundant, then, but what is the implication of, of having a super supra-Lestarian Well, uh, uh, I don't know if he's had a chance to read the chapter. We will look at the arguments against the supra- and infralapsarianism. Hodge has some very serious ones, and I agree with him myself. And the reason the majority of historic Calvinists have been anti supralapsarian and pro infralapsarian I, I think are serious reasons. But uh, I'll hold off now since we're going to look at that part later. But if they don't satisfy you, bring it up, uh, bring the question a little later if it will, Doctor. Anything else? Uh, yes, Edna? No, he doesn't. There's no sequence for God. There's no before and after. He's timeless. He's not thinking before the fall. <laughs> You take the words right out of your mouth, didn't you, Bob? That's right. And I don't have to live with you, but I have to live with this lady. <laughs> Somebody else is. <laughs> Drew has his problems, too. <laughs> and they, you just have to get used to that. That's all. They, uh, we can only describe it that way. We can simply say God is contemplating. You and I would think he contemplates the supra way, he contemplates the... Uh, the infra way and so on. He does, but just like that, timeless. Not to look, see, that's a hopeless amount of time, that clipping of the finger, you know. What are your mi ultimate microseconds? Uh, seconds? They're way below microseconds, aren't they? Billions of now, trillions of Yeah, trillions of them. You see, even that, that's a hopelessly long time to think about with respect to God. We can't even imagine so going to get six billions of data in a second, you know, that type of thing. You can't even imagine. I can't even say it that fast. And so and they, these crazy computers, these supercomputers, these mainframe computers could do it like that and so on. But they're, they're hopelessly. That doesn't make any difference how much progress he makes and so on. He's going to be sluggish to the end of time over against God. He sees all of that type of thing and knows not even a trillionth of a second. He couldn't possibly take that long for anything. But uh, and that, that's one of the things I think the computer age does for us. It just shows us what omniscience is. I mean, we can't even imagine what this guy can do with a computer, you see. <laughs> you can't even imagine that. 
You can imagine a god who, a god who conceives of computers, you know, is just hopelessly sluggish, and so on, and always will be. We can't even, we can't even express it, see, without taking a, some amount of time. But we have to remind ourselves, as I say, the reason for it is, if we once suggest that God has to learn anything, he's no longer the omniscient deity. It's just a difference of degree between him and us, that's all. So it can't be, but uh, nevertheless, when, when we talk about it, he knows this, we say that, he knows this, he knows that. He also knows that this is the way, in the opinion of Hodge and others and so on, other people like William Perkins and uh, Theodore Beza, there's no question about the fact that Theodore Beza, the successor of Calvin, was a uh, supralapsarian. But uh, it's uh, Perkins, whom we'll be looking at in that other course, Perkins was a strong supralapsarian, but they're very few and far between uh, today. But um, if there is any other question on page uh, 316 or 17, we come on 318 to these objections to supralapsarianism, which uh, has uh, been raised. And uh, uh, he cite, the first thing he gives is uh, the uh, point that Territon makes. Territon's a great 17th century Reformed theologian in Switzerland. It seems to involve a contradiction of a non-ends. I think you'd all get that Latin, will you? Would you not? And that which is a non-being of a non-being, as Territon says, nothing can be determined. See, that's what we were saying here in, in infralapsarian, you got before the mind of God, you got real beings. They're all uh, dead. Uh, here, is a, here is a being who is contemplated and uh, uh, no uh, uh, sequence of uh, beings contemplated at that moment. So to determine that this non-sequence of being, some should be chosen and some not, is a uh, is a hypothetical impossibility even for God. I mean, he'd be contemplating and making decisions about that which is not. In the, the supralapsarian view, where you can't say these are not beings, these people are fallen, and God has a whole uh, race of ma uh, fallen mankind before him. But uh, an unfallen mankind, you see, there, ne there never was an unfallen mankind. God decided against that. He could conceivably have, have decreed to uphold Adam so that he didn't fall, and there could have been a a sequence of all unfallen persons, just as there will be a, a, a body of redeemed and unfallable persons in heaven. They won't pr procreate as they do now. But uh, what Territon is saying here, what most of the infralapsarians say, is that uh, God is making a decision about uh, that which is not. Over here it's with respect to that which is. That's the first criticism. Uh, any comment or criticism of the criticism? Paul, will you? Yeah. I just don't get it, huh? <laughs> it's a whole timing thing to me, and at the end, you end up with some chosen and some not. Yes. What, what difference does it, does it really make? Well, uh, it doesn't make any difference in that sense of the word, but it does, uh, it, the, first, the first criticism, you see, of that, of, you, as you say, they both end up with some being saved and some being lost. So the same thing's true of Arminianism. They all end up with some being saved and some being lost. What difference does it make? You know, a great deal of difference. And here the... Here <laughs> <laughs> Here's a great deal of uh, a great deal of difference uh, too. But the first criticism of this possible way of understanding it is the fact that this would be a hypothetical impossibility. You're not saying God can't do something. You're just talking about a doing something which is meaningless. To think about a non-entity, making a decision about that which is not, and so on. The um, I don't know what the uh, superlapsarian defense of that would be. The um, the superlapsarians are, are strong Calvinists, and they're strong thinkers usually. And they, uh, one, the, the historic ones I've mentioned, like Camaras and uh, and Beza and Perkins. The um, this Twissa was another one, uh, and in our own time, Gordon Clark, are very formidable uh, thinkers. The uh, Van Til may be not clear, but. They're giants, uh, all of them. I've never seen a mediocre superlapsarian. Uh, there, you can <laughs> I haven't, Dale. As a matter of fact, I don't, that sounds funny. I was sort of laughing at myself on that one, but I can't, I can't think of it. Uh, you do have, you have run-of-the-mill Calvinists, you know, uh, infralapsarians, but I can't think of a, of a non-prodigious Calvinist. It's like the theonomists I've often said about them. They're all, they're all able people. The trouble is they're all chiefs and there's so few Indians in the movement, but they're all chiefs, there's no doubt about it. You, you name a theonomist and you're naming an extraordinary uh, a person. I think he's off on the wrong beat in many ways, but always ably so. And same way here, that doesn't prove anything one way or the other. A giant can err, 
He usually makes a gigantic error when he, when he <laughs> errors, too. And I think this is one of those. I think this is a gigantic error. Just if this, if this, val this criticism, for example, Paul, is valid, this is a very serious error. I mean, it can't get off its ground on that uh, thing. They have to say something about that. I'm trying to rack my own brains as to what I say. I remember uh, Bavink has a very fine discussion of this in The Doctrine of God. It's the first volume of his Dutch work. It has been translated, and he gives about 10 arguments for infralapsarianism and for supralapsarianism, much more thorough discussion than Hodge uh, uh, gives here. But uh, I don't remember offhand. This criticism is not so commonly given, and my guess at what a supralapsarian would try to say, I don't think he can escape this, but uh, what he would try to, uh, how the way he would try to escape it, I would think, would be to say that, uh, um, no, no, that's an artificial distinction, that uh, God could contemplate uh, an unfallen humanity as easily as he could contemplate a fallen humanity. I think that's the, uh, the, the tack they would take. But the infralapsarian would say to that, but there never has been an unfallen race of uh, mankind. The only uh, race that has been is, is this one. This is a real one. And God could contemplate it as fallen and could contemplate leaving it so or delivering it uh, totally or partially as the case may be. But uh, generally speaking, superlapsarians feel that infralapsarians are sort of limping Calvinists who are not quite as thoroughgoing as the supra. And if they don't watch themselves, they'll slip right over into Arminianism. That's their feeling about these uh, people. And as an infralapsarian, I have to say, we've got to watch ourselves very, very carefully at this point. It's very easy. Uh, if I ever tell you about the time one of my students was teasing me uh, a bit because I, I was wearing a red tie on one occasion. You know, the first one thing, then another. <laughs> I very often wear a red tie and so on, and it just teases with one thing and then another. But that, that, is, that is this very thing, you know. And it, you've got to listen very carefully to this type of thing. If somebody, especially a fellow Calvinist, of the prodigious ability that the superlapsarians have, uh, Gamaris, for example, was deeply distressed about the Synod of Dort because they were moving in this infralapsarian way. That's practically the end of Calvinism, in his opinion. I think Camaris was wrong. But Camaris was an able theologian. I want to listen to people like that and uh, want, to, want to watch and so on. And then Gordon Clark would say, oh, you, you're kidding yourself if you think you can be a Calvinist and not a superlapsarian, and so on. And Gordon Clark, again, is a person who I'd listen to carefully. I think he could easily go into extremes, and I think he did. But what the answer to that would be, I, I don't know. And the, the saying that... Uh, this is taking a higher view of God and vouchsafing the sovereignty of God more thoroughly than this. And this is a little weakening in the direction of, of uh, Arminianism. Saying that and proving it are two different things, and I don't see that they prove it. But anyway, let's take a look at the second objection that this uh, infralapsarian we're studying has to say. It's a clearly revealed scriptural principle that where there is no sin, there is no condemnation. Therefore, there can be no foreordination to death which does not contemplate its objects as already uh, sinful. Now, that's a very clear sort of argument. You, I think you all understand it. The question is whether you think it's a valid one or not. Does everybody understand? See, here, these people are all worthy of eternal damnation. They've fallen in Adam. Now, God can let them all perish. He can also, in accordance with his justice and his wisdom and so on, he can save all or some as he pleases. Now, you can see how that could be. But how could God decree to damn a person who doesn't even exist in his own mind, and certainly, if there's some way by which he can think of him, he can't think of him as a sinner worthy of condemnation. See, that's the problem that Hodge is talking about. That's a, to my mind, that's the deepest problem with, this, with uh, uh, superlapsarianism. The idea that God is actually choosing to reject a person when he's not rejectable. He has no basis for his condemnation. You can see how if God chose to lead me to my damnation, I could have no protest about that. I am fit for damnation. He certainly had no obligation to save me. If he saves me, it's a matter of pure mercy. But to damn me when there's nothing damnable about me, when I'm not a fallen person and so on, which is actually what's happening here. Now, here I am aware of what the... Let me take just a minute to Dale. Here I'm aware of what the um, superlapsarians would tend to say at that point. They are not damning a person, Gershner, because uh, he is a mere man and as, uh, as such not damnable. 
What God is doing is decreeing to let some perish and not let others perish. Now, they are capable, Gerstner, you would admit, you uh, infolapsarians, you would admit that man as man is capable of falling into sin. You better not deny that because you've admitted it with Adam, you see, normally, and so on. So you are admitting, are you not, you infolapsarians, that God could contemplate man and also contemplate giving him this ability to fall and bring himself into judgment. And we, we uh, superlapsarians are saying essentially that, that God contemplates man as man capable of falling and of decreeing to let him fall and so on. But you see what our reply to that would be, ah, oh, but you're slipping over into, into infolapsarianism. You're, you're letting God, yes, God is capable of creating a good creature who is able to choose the evil as indeed Adam did. And, but what you're doing now is slipping away from your superlapsarianism by considering this person who is capable of sinning as actually uh, being allowed to sin and perish, which is essentially the same thing as here. He's already in a state of sin and perishing, and God is decreeing not to save him, just as God is decreeing not to save Esau, not to save Judas, and so on. And he is decreeing to save another group. But you are really having God choose man as actually fallen, only you're using the word potentially able uh, to fall. But the difference is so uh, uh, minute that it's practically non-existent. But Dale, what were you going to say? Okay. All right. Any other question on that second point, Bob? Well, this isn't strictly on the second point. It's kind of related to it. At some point, will you try and, and clarify for me what the consequences are of this distinction between a superlapsarian and an infralapsarian? I don't see it clearly. I see. Now, well, they, they seem so close in so many things. As you say, yeah, you get around yeah, to a point yeah. where you say, well, you know, it looks like almost yeah. the same thing. Yeah. The second point, let's go on to the third point uh, here. The, uh, it, it becomes a little bit more. It seems plain from the whole argument of the apostle in Romans 9-9 nine, uh, nine, nine following that the mass out of which some are chosen and others left is the mass of fallen men. The design of the sacred writer is to vindicate the sovereignty of God and the dispensation not of life and death but of his grace, you see, uh, there. Now, that's a passage of, uh, I wish we had time to look at it in detail here, but that's a passage where the potter and the clay is used, you know, and many superlapsarians feel that's a sort of locus classicus of superlapsarianism. God can do what he will with the clay, just as the potter can do what he, what he will with the clay. And I feel people often reading into that, the idea that God can do what he pleases with man as man, see, with, as a potter with a clay. What Hodge is saying here, and I think he's right, and he's written a very fine commentary on Romans, I think what he's saying is, in spite of that strong language which Paul takes from Jeremiah and the potter and all, nevertheless, you can tell from the passage as a whole that the man he's talking about, the clay he's talking about, the, uh, the potter's uh, urn that he's talking about, is fallen man, and not simply Jacob and not Esau, see, and Pharaoh rejected and Moses uh, uh, chosen, and so he's talking about real uh, sinful people and not just his own sovereignty in doing what he will, as a potter does with, uh, with uh, clay, which does or does not uh, please him. So in this particular case, you have an actual uh, uh, passage, as he cites Romans 1 later on, to indicate that the... Uh, see, Romans 9 is classical. Anybody will admit that. Uh, whether he's Arminian, whether he's a uh, super or infralapsarian Calvinist, he'll admit that this is probably the fullest description in the Bible of the whole matter of uh, divine uh, uh, predestination. And uh, while the predestinary, I mean, while the Arminians are on our side on this, this is by far the lesser of the two Calvinistic evils in their opinion. And we show that they can't get away with their uh, Arminianism. It won't work at all in this uh, passage. But that the passage as a whole, in spite of that hard language of the potter and the clay, and cannot God do what he will with his own, and so on, is nevertheless a picture of fallen men, vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath, people who, uh, who sin brings uh, God's judgment upon them, people whom God bestows mercy on, and so on. And if that's a correct interpretation of the passage, as I think it is, but we really would have to work through it to satisfy ourselves on it, then it's a very strong biblical opposition to the notion of supra. Uh, lapsarianism. Let's read the others and then we'll take a look again at Bob's question there, whether there's a significant difference. For 
Creation is never in the Bible represented as a means of executing the purpose of election and reprobation. And uh, again, I think that's true. He, he wrestles with Ephesians 3, 9 and 10 to show that even that properly interpreted does not suggest that. And in the last argument he gives, is uh, number five, it is a further objection to the supralapsarian scheme that it is not consistent with the scriptural exposition of the character of God. He is declared to be a God of mercy and justice. But it is not compatible with these divine attributes that men should be foreordained to misery and eternal death as innocent. That is, before they had apostatized from God. If passed by and foreordained to death for their sins, it must be that in predestination they are contemplated as guilty and fallen. And I would say that is far and away the most serious uh, uh, criticism that there actually is. As I say, God is finding fault with man as man in this view. Man has not sinned. You've got to recognize that. If you man has sinned, you're in the infra or sub or after uh, sin situation. Now there it's perfectly just for God to damn the whole world. And his mercy actually supplies redemption by a way of justice so that he saves some. And it's utterly understandable that he would do that. But that he would actually, not that he would choose to keep some, that doesn't surprise anybody. That would be quite compatible with his nature but that he would reject some when they're not rejectable, when they haven't done anything that merits his, uh, his disfavor and his damnation. That's what, uh, that's what Hodge is saying. But number five, that's the gut objection, in my opinion, Bob. That's, uh, I, I think it is in Hodge's, but it certainly is uh, in mine. Yes, Dale. What would a superlapsarian say in response to that? Yeah. The, uh, the, um, I think... Uh, I think the, uh, my experience, you don't have a great many conversations. See, this is a very refined type of area. But as I say today, about the only person I can say without any doubt is a, a Calvinistic superlapsarian was the late Gordon Clark. There must be others. But you see, in an earlier day, when, uh, as I say, as Hodge mentions, there's some question as to whether John Calvin was or not. Most people interpret him as such. Uh, McNeil in your uh, library of Christian classics interprets him as such. When I asked my friend Ford Battles, who translates the Institute, he didn't know enough theology really to know. He, he knew Calvin, as I think I mentioned to some of you. Uh, the translator of the Institutes that we're using was himself a classical scholar who, because of his classical expertise, was uh, hired to translate the Institutes and it led to his conversion, apparently, you know, just working with uh, Calvin in the text. But he never lived long enough to get really familiar with Calvinistic theology. He was very familiar, he knew a good deal about it, but primarily he was a text man, a manuscript man, a critic, and he was always making new additions and uh, fine points and commentaries on them and things of that uh, character. And one time we asked him whether, in his opinion, uh, Calvin was a superlapse. <laughs> he made, I don't have an opinion on this subject. Ask Gerstner or something like that, that type of, that type of, uh, of thing. But McNeil, who uh, edits the whole uh, project and so on, you can see he's inclined to, uh, to that. And most of the secular interpreters of Calvin think he is, but the secular interpreters su seldom get into as fine a discussion as we've had here this afternoon. They really don't get into the fine points, and they frequently make the, they're very learned in certain areas, you know, and they have uh, enough footnotes to bury a uh, an army and so on, but at certain points they can be as stupid as a kindergartner, a toddler, can really be. It's, it's a funny sort of a thing, and they, many of them do not know Calvinism. I see that in Edwards all the time. Some people are very, very knowledgeable. They, they'll say goofs at times. They just they don't know certain areas. And they don't get this type of point, but so it's not significant. But it is a fact that most of them, people like Dumerg and other people like that, they, they'll immediately jump to the conclusion that he's a superlapsarian. The um, it's, it's just because they don't know the fine. But people who really know Calvin, they're, they're they're divided on the point. There are some statements of Calvin that sound superlapsarian. They're divided on Edwards too. But here again, knowledgeable people are divided on Edwards. There are some who think he's a a. a superlapsarian, and I know why they do, but the evidence uh, would not support their uh, conviction, and I think the majority would be with us on that. But at any rate, on, when you're up against this kind of question, talking with people who uh, either are superlapsarian or at least understand the issue here of the injustice of God in damning people who are not damnable and so on, their tendency... Uh, this is the reason they think Calvin is a super... In, in God's eyes, the heavens aren't chaste. Before him, you see, nobody has any real standing. They, they won't quite say God is unjust and so on, but they do get the impression he's almost above it. He does what he will, and they, they appeal to that vase, uh, that 
potter doing what he will with the clay. And who is the one who is being made to talk to the maker? Why hast thou made me thus? You know, that type of thing. And uh, they'll throw that around. And when I get in a conversation with them, come on now, let's talk very calmly about what we mean by that kind of a metaphor. Are you trying to say to me that God, because of his omnipotence and irresistibility, if he chooses to damn a person, you better recognize he's that person going to be damned and overlook any questions about justice or something like that. Well, they don't want to quite say that. You find there's a certain statement, if you've read the whole section here, there's a certain point where Hodge almost says you better accept it. It's a given fact that God's going to do this. You better, you better stop. Shut up. That's all there is to it. It's going to be done. Almost as if Mike makes right. It's perfectly true. If God's going to do something, we're wasting our time trying to frustrate it. But if we're asking ourselves the question, is he doing it justly? That's not answered by his running roughshod over us and trampling us underground and telling us to shut up and such things. That The question is not answered that way. He is a just God. As I've said often again, it's, uh, it's, you remember say, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He never says, I will have justice on whom I will have justice. And if you can really pin in justice on God, uh, you, you, he will not accept that. And so on. He will not ever say, look who you're talking to. Whatever I say is just is just. What, and uh, don't you talk back to the maker. So, no, no, no. You explain there. But I, what I'm trying to say in my fumbling way here is that when the, uh, when the supralapsarian faces this particular problem, he does have a little tendency to fall back on. He won't say it this crassly, but remember who God is. And is uh, the one who's made going to talk back to his maker, you see, that type of thing. I've heard Van Til say things like that in class, quoting Paul, but also saying it on his own uh, weight. He's a man who will not say he is or is not a supralapsarian, but at certain points he have talked that way. Now, that's not an answer, in my opinion, that do, uh, that do that. If they give an answer, they'll have a tendency, as I say, to fall over here into the fact that man will never be upright unless God holds him, so keeps him so. The only reason you can't fall out of heaven is because God will not let you fall out of heaven, that's all. And uh, since the creature is mutable, and the being tends to revert to non-being, and moral being to immoral being, and so on, only God can prevent it. And if you want to bring this next argument in, here, God has no obligation to do that, then you see God can make a creature upright and let him fall into uh, that, and thus, for all practical purposes, I hope this is not getting too technical, but for all practical purposes, at that point, when God creates you or me sinless and upright, he creates a mutable creature, and the only thing that's going to keep us that way is by his keeping us that way, but he doesn't have an obligation to do so. You can get that right out of Jonathan Edwards. That's the thing that makes me turn pale when I read it. It's a place where I can't understand his ever saying, but it's there. And so on. He doesn't have an obligation to keep it. But if you take that position, and there's an awful tendency, and you even see it in Hodge, then you see how this gets very, very close to man as man, almost inevitably. They'll never say that. They'll choke on it. Uh, Augustine, for example, put a, throat, uh, a sword across his throat rather than say it, but he'd go right along that edge there of saying that man as man will fall away unless God actually keeps him and God has no obligation to keep him. So what, you infolapsarians, what's the real difference there between the two? And what we say is at that point, now you don't dare say that a creature whom God makes upright would inevitably fall into sin. And they won't, as I say, then do that first and so on. But boy, they come perilously close to saying that type of... Uh, that type of thing, and that's the only way out of it. So if they try to take that hatch, see that escape hatch, they'll go right straight out into the, into the ocean uh, on it, we, we would say, but that's, I'm sure you know less now what I was saying that I, that I did 10 minutes ago there, but uh, at least I'm trying to make a very, very complex subject uh, understandable. Uh, a couple minutes before we uh, uh, take our break here, the, uh, we've been talking about supra and infolapsarianism pretty much together so that I don't think we'll need to take any time and when we come back we can go over to hypothetical redemption a rather interesting little 18th century 17th century uh, development but before we close any other questions or comments on the supra infralapsarian question so that we can start out with hypothetical redemption when we come back which is a rather intricate idea itself and then uh, save most of our time for looking at the Augustinian plan which is our plan which which we think is what the biblical doctrine actually teaches but if there's no uh, further question, let's take our 10 minute break right now. You came down there too fast, Paul. 
How did you ever make it so quick?